So hello, everybody. I'm really excited to be here with, uh, with uh, Deacon Enoch. Deacon Enoch is, of course, uh, an Ethiopian Christian, Tawedo Christian. He also has a YouTube channel uh, called The Philosophy of Art and Science. So you can look that up and find him. He's also on the Ephesus Network, where he is doing several things with different, uh, different types of Orthodox uh, discussions and everything. So I'm really excited to have him on because we're going to, uh, to talk you know, there, people can't get enough of talking about Ethiopia and uh, and the particulars of their traditions, and so we're going to look go into that together. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. you so much Jonathan for having me on the program well, I'm really happy you know it's funny because when I know I mentioned that on the podcast I said uh you know I kind of said for people to to reach out if they wanted to I got so many messages suggesting you and then I realized that even that before that I actually gotten messages from people suggesting you like the first time the first moment we did the first video I had people talking about you but it, I get so many messages that sometimes it just becomes like noise that I don't, I can't totally pay attention to. But then when I, after I asked that, then I remembered, I said, I think, I think many people have been suggesting him for a long time. So. It, it's so funny that you said that because I've gotten a few people to comment and, you know, they think if I just reach out that they will, it'll happen. But the podcasting world for people to, to know behind the curtain, it doesn't always work like that, especially when you have a large following the way that, that you've said. And I've actually been following your work for years. And I know you were surprised that, I had already known you from your breaking down of Kanye as the fool to watch out for the stuff you've done with Jordan Peterson and, and father Andrew as well. Like I, I had been following your work and I've been sharing your artwork on Twitter whenever you, you would post, you know, the, the cosmos and, and everything like that. So it, it's really great. And then when Richard reached out to me, it was funny because Richard and I were already Facebook friends, but he's kind of pseudonymous anonymous. I didn't realize how many Facebook friends I had. Him and I were already friends on Facebook. That's funny. Yeah. So a nice confluence of things kind of coming together. So maybe tell us a little bit about yourself. I know you live in the US. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your your involvement in the church and kind of the way that you see it also as an American, uh, Ethiopian American. Yeah, so I love the Anglo-Saxon saying, but for the grace of God, go I. And it's very true. My service, my ministry is sometimes inexplicable to people outside of, you know, the, the Holy Ghost or anything to that effect. Um, I was, I am born and raised in Los Angeles, California, and I am the son of two immigrants who came to America one year before the fall of Emperor Haile Selassie's mm. regime, which if you go on the conservative estimate was about a 700 year uh, Orthodox Christian monarchy. And depending on if you want to say it's continuous or not, some people like to throw the number 3000 year regime, um, including in the early days, pagan, but beginning in the 300s AD, uh, Orthodox Christian kingdom. And so according to the official yeah. records, it's one lineage all the way back to Solomon, basically. That That's right. And there are a lot of people, you know, depending on if you're uh, a member of the symbolic world or if you're one of the academic historians, how you want to count it. But the most conservative estimate would bring it back to 1270 AD. That's the which is loss. which is really even if it's 700 years, it might still be the oldest. Like uh, it may be, except for like China, like you know how they had these super long uh, dynasties, or Japan or yeah. something. It's probably one of the oldest dynasties in the world. It, it's super old, and I didn't realize a lot of these things until I was an adult because you know part of it is is trauma that people in my parents' generation faced, and part of it is things that they did. But basically, their generation was involved with Marxist Leninism. Some of them would like to claim that all they wanted was feudal reform. And, and I mentioned this not delve, to delve too much into politics, because it's so much of what makes up my being and, and where I am. And so 
Ethiopia's pivotal moment was 1974 when communism took over and all the former institutions were, were shattered. And it wasn't that it happened in a day. It was kind of a, a long process of, of decades that also involved the West and not just Russia. Yeah. And um, interestingly enough, we had ties with the Tsarist Russia too. So it's funny that we had later ties with, with communist Russia. And so the, the elites were, a number of them were executed by the communist regime and another of them were drained from the country during during a time period of like 20 to 30 years. And so my parents left right before all of that took off. And then a lot of their friends were in the midst of that. So I grew up in a milieu of all of these people who were Ethiopian elites drained from the country and then who were living abroad and just trying to focus and, and you know assimilate to American society. Yeah. So I assimilated very well. Both of my parents were trained in British schools. So, you know, they knew English before they came to this country, mm -hmm. but they also were very strict about me learning the Amharic language, which is the official language of, of Ethiopia. And for me, I was raised really nominally Christian. I was baptized. I went to all the high holidays, but I was never a Sunday Christian. And I went to various, you know, schools. I went to a Lutheran middle school. I went to a Church of Christ, which is part of the revivalist American tradition, 1800s college, which made me confront the idea of mm. Christ. And so in adulthood, I came to the church, started off pouring holy water. They realized I spoke Amharic. So they made me sing, even though I couldn't really sing. So I became a chanter. Then they said, oh, he's, uh, he knows how to teach. So they made me teach in English. Then they priests started having me sub for them teaching in Amharic at funerals and other services. And then they said, you know, it's really weird that we have this unordained guy that we call Mr. Enoch and we can't just call him Mr. Enoch. So let's uh, throw this deacon title on him. So I have a little bit of a, a windy path and a different path. You know, most people in the Ethiopian church become deacons between the ages of like eight and 13. I became it at the canonical age in our tradition of 25. Mm. So it's, uh, it's been about five, six years and uh, it's, it's been a great train. And I, I predominantly focus on, on scripture and, and liturgy, but I have a little bit of uh, competency and knowledge of some other parts of the church as well. So are there formal trainings or is it all kind of imbibed into like within the church? Like, do you take, have you taken classes or is it just this? So in Ethiopia, there are formal schools. There's the traditional school. It's called Abinet, which actually in Amharic means fatherhood, which is great. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it, if you think about it from the educational models in the United States, it would drive, you know, educators here insane because what they do is, you know, I'll give you one example. The administrator of my church, who's a monk, he's a hiero monk. He uh, left his house at age 10 and he decided wherever he wanted to go throughout the whole country. And you have one school of poetry. You have one school of the main liturgy, which is the Eucharistic liturgy. You have another school, which is the non-Eucharistic liturgy. And then you have another um, school dedicated to scripture and patristics. And he went to and fro to whatever school he wanted without anyone watching him. And he was a deacon at age 10. At 22, he decides to be a monk. And basically, you know, he got all of his church education between 10 and 22 and you can say it's like a hyper humanities program with, you know, mm. indigenous PhDs, but, you know, he, he couldn't do multiplication, you know, because they don't right. study even the basics of arithmetic. All they focus on are church teachings. It's amazing. And so, and so there are different the schools. schools. So it's like you go to one school to learn one aspect. And the one that really fascinated me was poetry. Po poetry. Yeah. So it's called Kini. Uh, which Kini and Guz, uh, which is the liturgical language and the, the language of the right, Kini means to submit. And so the idea is you create poetry that submits to the Lord and glorifies him and then also the saints through whom which he is glorified. And there are a million different categories. I don't even know them all, mm. but the two main ones, the two most important because they have to do with communion time. One is called Kivriiti, which means uh, she is honorable, uh, referring to the time, which is the moment in which the communion descends and is being distributed to the mm. people. And that is poetry that is reserved exclusively about Christ and Christological themes. And then you have the Etana uh, Moger, which is like the something like the um, 
I don't know the full translation, but something like the the rising incense where you're allowed to speak of the cloud of witnesses of all the saints to glorify mm. God, which is after the beginning poetry is. So people study the poetry in advance. They, they're not allowed to write it down. They're supposed to memorize it. And then they perform it in the church one time. And then, you know, they move on from there. That's it. Some, Wait, that's one, it. Uh, one time. One time. So there's original is poetry being created by tens of thousands of clergy every day that is, is amazing I, whenever people tell me is is a dead language i say hogwash but well, that is astounding and so they perform it during the liturgy they perform it every sunday during the liturgy at um you know there are three different types of parishes, let's say small, medium, and large, every medium and large, definitely every large parish will do it. If it's a basic church where someone's not trained in the poetry, where all they do is the main function of the, of the liturgy, they wouldn't perform it there. For example, at, at my church, we don't have a poetry master. We have a couple priests who studied it a little bit. So we do it only on the high holidays. But they'll at, have to uh, take them longer to prepare, like they'll prepare their poem and everything. Exactly. But there's a master at a, at a parish, for example, that a friend of mine attends in San Diego. They do it every Sunday, which is the tradition in Ethiopia. That's astounding. And so are there some poems that are so that have been kind of so intense that, that people remember them, let's say? Yes. And they're written down. There's um, there's a, a different books like what they'll say, Freilik Awent, which means the, the fruit of the sages, or Yelik Awent Kene, which is the poetry of the sages, and they'll write them down in, in famous books. Actually, the administrator of my church, who I mentioned to you earlier, he's uh, unique in that he learned this poetry, although he didn't master it, he learned this poetry from a nun named Mahoy Galanish, and she herself was the student of her father, who was a master. It's mm. rare for women to, to enter these fields, especially at the highest level, especially to become a master and then to be teaching, you know, all the boys coming up in, in the faith. But, you know, there's one famous one where I, I'm going to butcher it. it. People could go to my channel where a friend of mine who studied for about a year to two years, he performed it on my, on my channel. But it's, it's something to affect where speaking about the digits of, of Christ, there are a few different layers to the poetry. One of the layers is that it has to hit a certain rhythm because yeah. it's not just read aloud, but it's, it's poetry that's sung. It's so chanted the, basically it's chanted. So it has to meet the, the rhythm and the melody of the chanting. And then it has to have a, a basic meaning known as the wax. And then underneath the wax is the gold which is supposed to be the, the Christological meaning or whatever other religious meaning. And so there's, there's a saying about how the thumb is greater than the other fingers and how both uh, Jesus and Nicodemus were rabbis, but they weren't the same type of rabbi. You know, Jesus mm. was the thumb and uh, Nicodemus was one of the other digits. So this, the same way in which the thumb guides the, the other fingers separating us from other creatures, Jesus is separated from Nicodemus. That's like one example of something they would do. And they would, you know, they would yell it. One person would yell it in Giz, and then the person would, the other person would stand in front of them and would sing it before the congregation. Oh, okay. So it's, the person performing will have a chanter, will then redo it, will actually sing it. Yes. And usually the person who is speaking it is usually more learned than the person who's just singing it because the, the fundamental basic levels are just repeating, like you said, famous poems of, of the sages or of the scholars and then singing it, singing these famous lines, whereas the actual construction of the original poetry will take a while. Yeah, that's amazing. That's astounding. I mean, I, I'm sure there's so many things like that, that, that people don't know about that are just like an entire tradition of poetry that's recited one time in church. We have nothing like that. I mean, one of the things people complain about in the, the, the Orthodox church and the, the, the Greek Russian church is the stifling, a little bit of the stifling of the, of hymnography, where we feel like there isn't a lot of room for modern day poets or modern day people to kind of enter into the tradition and participate in this, this pattern of glorification, you know, and rising up the saints and rising up God, but you, but the, the, the your tradition seems to have this balance of, you know, the normal liturgy, but then at each liturgy, there is a moment where, but, and it's not just like kind of 
I don't want to be insulting, but it's not like just like improvised hands in the air, you know, screaming a thing. It's an actual form that has pattern and, and everybody recognizes as, as this uh, poetry tradition. It's just astounding to me. Yeah. yeah. And they're recognized usually as the most intelligent people. And usually they will not let you study scripture or patristics unless you've spent one to two years in the poetry school. Like that's a requirement at many of the scripture and patristic schools. Yeah, you wish they had that here. All those Bible <laughs> scholars that they could just uh, study poetry, we'd get a lot of less, like a lot of lot less his, his critical historical nonsense that we get that we get now. So I have a big question for you. This is my big question because I'll be honest with you. I, I think that both Richard and I, when we did the three episodes on Ethiopia, we were obviously a little nervous because we're talking about something which, in a way, is very far from us, and we're also talking about how when we look at Ethiopia and the traditions, the Christian traditions, and because it's related to the Ark and all of that, well, you've, learned, you've heard them. We talk about, about the stories and everything as kind of this extremes, going into extremes. And so my, my question from the beginning was, how would someone who lives in the church and, and worships in the church, would, would, how would they interpret the way that we, we saw it? Well, I will tell you, I'm, I'm biased in a little bit, but I'll tell you all the sides of it. And my bias is that while I am firmly rooted in the church and, you know, I mean, my, my father's side of the family are basically Levites, you know, several generations of, of clergy, even though it skipped his generation, um, I, I grew up in the West. Yeah. And so I have, you know, a native fluency in the Amharic language, uh, intermediate knowledge of Ge'ez, and I've been serving in the church over a decade. However, there are still some parts of me which are Western. So yeah. one example I can give you is that any sort of deep conversation about the Ark begins to make Ethiopian Orthodox nervous. It, it's almost as if the mystery is cheapened whenever mm. you talk about it. And so you'll see, I think, another aspect that's unique about Ethiopia. Uh, everyone has kind of um, like holy drapes or holy clothing and covers that you put on items. The Ethiopian church, almost to the point of like secrecy or Gnosticism, hides everything. Uh, one thing I could tell you is we're in communion with the Copts and the Copts have their clergy commune and finish the rest of communion in front of the entire audience. Uh, without getting too specific to freak out the Ethiopians, I'll say the Ethiopians don't do that, and yet we're in communion. Mm. So there, there's something hidden there where nobody sees the clergy taking communion, mm -hmm. actually, in our tradition. And it's like the Ark, there's very few things spoken about it. My bishop, actually, who's the bishop of Southern California, beginning in the 90s, began preaching explicitly, telling people what's physically written on all of the tablets and a lot of people freaked out but it's it's absolutely normal in terms of the elites who have always known this information it's just this balance of is this information only for the elites or you know are we on youtube now and hundreds of thousands of people will be hearing about it and talking about it but i think both of you were extremely respectful um i told you before we kind of hopped on I have two kind of minor, maybe three minor points of contention, but overwhelmingly you were doing it from a place of love. And I think both of you were very well researched. The idea on a serious note of the extreme edge and the inclusion of the, of the outsider, I mean, the Gentile par excellence, it's like, it's not just a Gentile, but a dark skinned Gentile. Like that's what Ethiopia is always in scripture. And and the arc language that you all used as the container, I think was, I think it's going to be very informative for very, uh, for the English speaking Ethiopian world, for the diaspora Ethiopian Orthodox. I think it's going to be very enlightening and, and illumining uh, as well. Like the, the whole monster on the lake story that you told, the fact that you asked the guide and he was reluctant and then he <laughs> talked about that. I was crying on my way to work while I was listening to that episode because it's, it's so true that some of the more secular tour guides wouldn't want to talk about that because they think something like that is embarrassing, mm. but a Sabbath honoring monster is definitely noteworthy. Yeah, it's definitely, it was, to me, it was like, I felt like I was in a, like I was in a fairy tale. I was happy about it. I was like, I feel like I'm in the world of, uh, of magic, you know? I mean, there are so many, when I was in Ethiopia, there were so many kind of magical moments. My, my guy knew the old guardian of the ark. 
you know, because there, there, there's the one that was actually serving, and then there was the one who was kind of retired but couldn't leave the, the, the precinct. And so he said, you know, would you want uh, to meet him? <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, of course I want to meet him. Like, how can you even ask that? So he's like, okay. He's like, I just want to tell you, we'll go there. You know, I'll knock on the door. I'll say if he wants to meet you. Um, but he said, don't ask him about the art because he's sick of hearing about that. Like, just don't ask him about that. Uh, and so I'm like, okay, cool. So I, we go there and he goes down, you know, it's like another door on the side down at the bottom of the building and he knocks and he talks to the guy. And then I see him come out, this old man, you know, covered in his, in his cloth. And I, I mean, I don't know what to do. I just kind of smile and say hello and, and just kind of, kind of bow a little bit. And then he asked me, he says, is there something you want me to bless? And I was like, oh. And so I realized, I remembered that I had brought one of my very early carved icons. Like when I was in Africa, I was living in Kenya. I carved this little icon. So I'm like, yeah, I have this icon in my bag. So I go in my bag, I take on my icon. So imagine like I have one of my very first icons that I carved. I hand it to him. He looks at it. And my guide was interpreting for me. And he says, oh, it's modern. (laughs) <laughs> like only an Ethiopian man could look at one of my icons and say like, Oh, it's a, it's a, it's very modern. Like it's very, you know, it's not very traditional. Yeah. So he, he, so he looks at it and he says words actually that I can't understand. And he spits on it several times and it spits and says, and says the words and gave it back to me. And so I still have it. Obviously I'm going to keep it forever. I'm never going to get rid of that but icon. It was one of those amazing. Yeah. These just these kind of amazing magical moments uh, that I had in Ethiopia. Um, so have you been to Ethiopia? Do you go, do, have, you, have you traveled? Yes, I've been, I don't know exactly how many times, but something like 12 times. If you add them all up, it'll, it'll probably be two years, but it's one month, three weeks, two months at a time. F- throughout my childhood, it's been a decade since I've been, but throughout my childhood, I went every other year. And that's, I think, what strengthened my, my ties to, to Ethiopia. One of the things I, I left out of my short bio in the beginning is that with the fall of the regime in Ethiopia, the last vestige of this 3000 year dynasty is the Ethiopian Orthodox church. It is the only thing that is still standing that preserves that. And so my parents weren't very outwardly pious. I would say they were inwardly pious in the way, you know, Jesus often would recommend throughout, for example, the gospel of Matthew, the sort of sermon on the Mount life of not doing things for people, but doing things behind closed doors. Um, and like I said, they, they kept the structure of it for me, but they never imposed it upon me. And it was really a love of Ethiopia, just being a proud Ethiopian that made me assess the situation and realize that the, the strongest institute of Ethiopia is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So going back home, uh, I mean, you see that, like, I didn't grow up in the church. So I remember one of my earliest memories is being in Ethiopia at my grandparents' house, both of whom lived on the same street. My um, grandparents had passed away, the the fathers, but the mothers were there. Mm. And the priest would come to your house randomly, you'd feed them and, you know, they'd do the house blessing. So he's doing the house blessing. And he puts the holy water on my face, but you know it's it's a little forceful because they expect <laughs> you to to have you know the cultural competency that I did not have. Like they expect you to know what to do, like you didn't know what to do yet. I had no. I walked up to my mother. I think I was about ten or twelve years old, and I said, "If that guy comes and throws water on my face one more time, I'm going to beat him up. So you better warn him." <laughs> you know, and to go from that to you know where I am now, where I have that that understanding that that's a blessing. Uh, because again, none of it was explained. It just like assumed that everyone knows, you know, what's, what's going on. And especially yeah, exactly. diaspora kids do not always know. Mm. So one of the questions I have too is, for example, in, in the West and in, in the, the, the Greek Russian world, you know, the Eastern Orthodox world, are there, we have patrons, saints, right? We, so we have the saints, but the saints are also end up being localized somehow, but also localized like parishes are named after saints. And, and we have a sense in which also people take on the names of saints and, and have their own kind of personal patron saint. So is that a tradition which Ethiopians also have? So um, one of the minor points of contention is something that a lot of British writers have written about. And, you know, it's, it's really helpless, but the, the, the most recent biology has shown that we are not Sabaean. So they compared our DNA to Saudis, to Yemeni, to Levantine, to Egyptians, to Sudanese. I mean, they're really trying to find the quote unquote 
non-African component. Everyone comes from Africa, but you know, all of Eurasia left Africa 60,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the quote unquote non-African part of Ethiopians, particularly the Amhara, uh, which is, you know, the ruling class for this time period we're talking about, is found to be closest actually to the Minoan civilization and to Tunisian Jews. Okay. Uh, and, and so uh, that, that part of the biology, uh -huh. I think, goes to the hybridity that a lot of you were talking about. And so, um, you know, the patron saint culture in the West or, you know, in the East, if we could call you the East and us, yeah. the Orient, uh, as you all joked about, in the East and the West versus the Orient is this predominantly, I think, more individualized society. And us being this hybrid of, you know, Tunisian, Jew, Minoan uh, adjacent, which is our Eurasian side, has this individual component. But we also have our East African side, which is more communal. And so the patron saints are more regional than they are individual. I mm -hmm. don't know of anyone who really has an individual patron saint, and there's no real formal process, although some people may do that. But there are certain institutions. I would say the capital city is a little different, but historic Ethiopia in the, in the various regions would venerate the saint that's from their region right. or who ended up in their region. You mentioned Abbo or Gabraman Faskardus, who's the saint who let the bird drink out of his eye. Yeah. He's considered an Egyptian, but he is uh, particularly, uh, for example, not venerated in this region called Gwajam because in his uh, story, it is said that the evil eye was found there. So those people don't like to have him as a patron saint, whether huh. you're an individual there from not. Um, Takla Haimanot, who's the one with wings that yeah. you mentioned, like the seraph, he is from a region called Shoah. And so while he is, because of other political reasons, also venerated in Egypt and in Eritrea and other places, the, the main place where he's venerated is a region called Shoah, which is where he's from. Hmm. Abba Aragawi, another saint whom you mentioned, one of the nine Greco-Syrian or so-called Roman, you know, Eastern saints, Roman, yeah. the Rumi saints. Uh, he was, you know, Greco-Roman, you know, like, but his, the, where he landed is modern Tigray. And so the region of Tigray and parts of Eritrea, modern Eritrea, is where he's venerated the most. So it's <laughs> super regional. In addition to that, like I said, if you live in the capital city, maybe your patron saint is whatever church parish you grew up at, where the capital city would be different than the other historic regions. Another thing we have, I don't know if you have this tradition, it's called the Sawam Aibar, which is the cup fellowship. So people will choose, you guys joked about, uh, you know, how we, uh, a medieval emperor introduced monthly holidays in addition to the biannual ones. So these cup fellowships will meet every month for the holiday of whatever saint they choose. And it's up to this group to decide. It could be two people. It could be 15 people. It could be 30 people. And what they do is they feed the poor in the name of the saint, and then they feed themselves. And they, they act as a, a sort of mutual aid program as well okay. for each other. If there's a wedding or a graduation or a funeral, they cover each other's expenses as well, mm -hmm. all in the name of this saint. And okay. so in that sense, it's like a, a, a regional patron saint and then these small cup fellowship patron saints. But other than that, there's no real individual patron saints. In the yeah. Region. But the way you describe it, it seems like it's very embodied, like especially in these cup fellowships where people will actually kind of, let's say, see themselves as a, as a communion of love where they help each other and they kind of support each other in, in the under the guise of a particular saint, obviously, ultimately under the guise of Christ, but kind of through the patronage of a, of a particular saint. So, I mean, that's very interesting because it sounds like it's also a kind of social net, yeah. like a, a kind of social net to help to help uh, palliate for, for tragedy and for suffering. I give you the idealized version. You know, sometimes that, that institution breaks down sometimes and it I'm becomes sure. only a social event, you know, yeah. but, but when it is good, you know, it's, it's a charitable organization that also takes care of the people within and with, and without. Mm, interesting. Def definitely. And so one of the things we didn't talk about, but I wanted you to maybe explain a little bit or uh, 
talk more about is that, for example, it seems like we have Christmas, right? We have the, the Feast of the Nativity. Uh, but it seems my perception is that that Ethiopian Christians, they have uh, they have Tim Kat, they have the the the, the feast of the of the, the baptism of Christ, but you don't so much have a uh, feast of nativity, or do you have the feast of nativity? Oh, we have the feast of nativity. Okay, and all it's right. It's huge. It's all right. huge, uh, particularly it... in an area called Lalibela, where the monolithic churches are. I don't know if you had a chance. Yes, to yeah, of that. course, I went to Lalibela. <laughs> yeah, that that is Christmas, and they say Christmas in Lalibela, Tumkat in Gwonder, or Epiphany Theophany in Gwonder. And oh, uh, right. Okay, so nativity there, and then you go to Epiphany. Or Theophany or in, in uh, Gondor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's where they and, have the big, huge pool in Gondor, right? Where everybody yes. jumps in. And, and an aside for my Tolkien fans in the audience, I, I still stipulate, although I think people will contradict me, that I think both Roha and Gondor were named after Tolkien's knowledge of Ethiopia because there's a city called Roha in Ethiopia. Okay which is the old name of Lalibela before it was named Lalibela. Really? And then you have the city of Gondor. And these are the two cities that we're talking about. And those are the two human city states in, in Lord of the Rings, right? Those, well, those are real places in Ethiopia, and I think that's too much of a coincidence. Yeah, well, for sure, one. for sure, Gondor. I remember hearing when I saw the name, I thought, "Well, this is way too close. This is way <laughs> too close to Lord of the Rings." There's, there's got to be some kind of Alibella is called Roha, R O H A. Yeah, interesting. So there is so so people celebrate nativity in, in Lali. But people so celebrate nativity, and typically nativity is uh, that period. Each season of the calendar has its own name. That that period is called Zemana Asterio, which means the era of revelation or mm. or being made clear or manifestation. And so Christmas is usually thought of as being celebrated with Epiphany slash Theophany at the baptism of Christ. And that, that whole season is considered one season. And people right. are, uh, the hymnography of the church is, is the same. You sing baptism and Christmas songs like every day throughout that. I don't know the exact period. It's like two weeks or, or something. And of course, there's a, there's a fast right before Christmas. Yeah. And there's a one day fast uh, that, that that's like a 30, 40 day fast. It's called the fast of the prophets. And then there's like a one day fast, usually in the middle of epiphany slash theophany celebration. And there's a monthly Mary holiday during that time too. And they call it like the manifestation Mary holiday. Mm -hmm. And then people usually think it has to do with the manifestation of Mary, but no, it's actually manifestation of Christ, but yeah. it's the Mary holiday that lands within that period of the church cycle. Yeah, that symbolism, I think it's still there. We still have it in, in, in our churches, but it seems like it's very strong in, in your tradition, the idea of understanding the incarnation and also the baptism in all this imagery of light, right? As this kind of shining forth of the revelation of Christ, you know, and, and so I think that that's just, it's a very powerful symbolism, especially for people today, as we, we kind of, we, we come back to the story of Christ and the way that I'm trying to help people understand it, that it's the pattern of reality, right? It's, it's not just, it's not just a story. And so the idea of the incarnation is being this light, which actually shines upon creation and helps us see it in its proper form and helps us see, you know, what everything is kind of moving towards what the, what the, what the reason for all of this is ultimately. Uh, yeah. yeah something very powerful. To your tradition, there's something called which is the hidden teaching. And it's, it's one of these extra biblical writings, which are performed, you know, there's a, interpretation of it but then there's also the text itself and a friend of mine who studied it intensely has told me it's it's closest in the in the greek orthodox communion to the mystagogy and that's one of the things said both at christmas and at, at uh, the baptism of christ or theophany okay interesting so it's called the hidden teaching basically yeah it's called the hidden teaching uh that's that's the is name for it um but it's related to uh, the mystagogy in the Greek. Yeah, Orthodox yeah. Church. Well, I mean, you see these, the mystagogies, you'll also see them, different mystagogies as exactly kind of revealing the secret of what Christ is, basically. You know, it's almost as if now for us, it's become so tame to say something like, he's God incarnate, like as if that's not a big deal. As if it's not the most crazy, the craziest thing you've ever heard, especially that he dies on a cross, right? It's like all these things are so, are so uh, mysterious. That, that to, to remember how even in, in the early centuries, they almost had to whisper it or they had to wait until people were baptized before they revealed like 
the fact that we're eating is flesh and blood. Like, you know, it was very, it's almost like, you can't just say this out loud or else, you know, they're going to kill you. <laughs> the just, catechumens must depart. Exactly. The catechumens must depart. Depart. Uh, so uh, one of the big questions I have is, is the man, like, is the kind of the mystery of Lalibela. And so for people who don't know, Lalibela is, you've seen, everybody's seen pictures of them, but these rock dug churches that are kind of networked together uh, in the city of Lalibela. Um, and so how do you, what is the function of Lalibela? Let's say like what liturgically, theologically, historically, what is it? What is the function of it? Well, I first, because of the History Channel, have to say it's not aliens. I have to first say that. That Greek <laughs> guy, he's and the fact that he's Greek, I'm like, come on, man. You got Orthodox in your family. At least you should know. He attributes it to aliens. But so, he attributes Lali Bella to aliens? Yes. Okay, yeah, on the History Channel. Okay, whatever. Of all places. Yeah, man. Um, because it couldn't be angels and humans in collaboration, um, which is what the Ethiopian story is, mm. uh, which is much more beautiful. Yeah. And... The story of Lalibela goes back to what I was saying earlier about people who nitpick at the nitpick at the 3000 year history of Ethiopia. So there's a clear start of a specific dynasty in 1270 AD and the dispute is whether that is a restoration or something totally new. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that dispute exists in the first place is because Aksum as we know it the, the great ancient civilization runs from about 180 to 300 AD pagan, and then 300 AD to uh, about 900 AD as an Orthodox Christian uh, kingdom. And that regime falls and is replaced by something called the Zagwe dynasty. And the typical Zagwe story is that they are descendants of the ministers of the Queen of, uh, of, of, Queen of Sheba, who intermingled with the ministers of King Solomon. So not directly of Solomon and Sheba, but of the ministers and all those people. And so that regime lasted about 200, 300 years from around 900 AD to 1270 AD when it fell. And that was the kind of interlude. And then whether Aksum and 1270 are connected, that's for different people to have their opinions on. That, so people say that in 1270, it was a restoration of Solomonic dynasty that happened, basically. That's the Solomonic that's the tradition. claim. Yeah. That's, that's the tradition. And part of the historical uh, tension is that pretty much all the information we have is from that Solomonic dynasty. Yeah, so really people will have... say it's biased. It's, yeah, that, it, that yeah. it's tendentious. So, then and, and I have my good friend who knows about the hidden teaching He's a, a big fan of that, that Zagwe dynasty, that, that intermediary 300 years. It's kind of, um, there's a very specific, the Ethiopian church is a, an amalgamation of three things, of Antioch, of Alexandria, and of itself, of Aksum. And we always have the Aksum element, but the Coptic element, sometimes when people paint the story, it's like, oh, we were Coptic till the 1950s. They don't realize that, that Coptic connection was very feeble and there's little historic evidence for it for sometimes like a thousand years. You know, sometimes they are said to have said a Muslim to be our archbishop. Really? Some, yeah. Sometimes it goes 23 years, a hundred years without sending a bishop. And people hmm. are like, well, what happened in those intermediary years? Well, what happened is Antioch is still right there. And there are some stories sometimes in the 1200s, sometimes in 10, uh, like 1000 AD, where sometimes they say at one moment there were 100 Syrian bishops. And it's like, why were there 100 Syrian bishops? What were they doing there? You know, what was uh, going on? My friend also believes that sometimes the, the Archimandrites uh, that people describe as Archimandrites may have acted as sort of indigenous bishops in these intermediate years. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lack of clarity. But anyway, all this is context for Lalibela or Roja, in, in which case that period, are, including Lalibela, who's a, a king, are a series of like four or five priest kings. And so they're both priests in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and they're also kings and emperors of all of Ethiopia. So and when is this again? Between 900 and 1270. They're like okay, so that's I'm sorry to say, but that's do you know the legend of Prester John? Do you know about yes? That sounds yes. exactly like that's just what it is. That's like they're and priest that's kings. Why they oh my goodness. Yeah, that's and that's what they were. That's what they were. And and you know, most kings grew up in monasteries uh to hide them 
so that they don't get slaughtered as yeah. potential claimants to the throne. But, you know, at, at ver- some of them leave when they're eight, some leave when they're 15. There are various accounts. I, I spoke recently about um, Emperor Theodros, who's one of, Emperor Theodore, one of the famous, very famous uh, uniting Ethiopian kings of the 1800s. And one of the most pivotal moments in his life is he was raised in a monastery. And at one point, he's like 12 or 15, I forget his exact age, marauders come and slaughter everyone in the monastery. And this is like, this is not a hagiography. This is the guy's chronicle. And he's the sole survivor. Oh, my goodness. And, and so he became a little bit of a political realist after that. He still, you know, had the, the Lord's name on his lips. But, you know, some of his actions, people thought of him as a brutal guy but he's a little traumatized slightly traumatized ptsd uh yeah Yeah. imagine you live in a monastery and that that happens to you but so anyway king lalibela at this time i think it also kind of coincides with the rise of islam and uh at various points ethiopia controls kind of modern day yemen parts of india and that whole red sea route through which we saw in the past year in in modern times that, uh, you know, if the Suez Canal is blocked, people got to go all the way around Africa. And you yeah. have to realize Ethiopia ruled that. At Controlled the- that, that, that seaway. Yeah. And so that 900 to 1200 is the receding period where the empire contracts and it's more local. And so the trade routes, uh, we had been pilgrimaging since early on, I don't know, fourth century, fifth century to Jerusalem. Yeah. Some people say that the Armenian alphabet was made by an Armenian monk uh, or priest who met up with an Ethiopian one in Jerusalem and used, uh, because they have an Indo-European language of its own branch, it, they used the the script from the Ethiopians, but they had totally different sounds. Really? They, I'd never they heard that Semitic, before. Yeah, so they would think that the Gez, like the Gez script is what influenced uh, Armenian script. Absolutely. And look at the Armenian script and look at the Ethiopian one. I mean, now like, that you say it, now that you say it, I'm like, I'm, I mean, not an expert, but now that you yeah. say it, I'm like, it looks a lot more like Armenian that than Armenian ours, that's for sure. Yeah. And Armenia is in our communion as well. But yeah. so these trade routes to Jerusalem, which had been around for centuries, get blocked mm. because of the rise of Islam and the changing geopolitics. And so King Lalibela, uh, who's also a priest, Father Lalibela as well, and a saint in the church, yeah. um, he decides to create a new Jerusalem, which is not to be confused, you know, with the heavenly Jerusalem, but a new kind of physical mm. Jerusalem in Ethiopia so that people don't have to pilgrimage to Jerusalem anymore because those trade routes were cut off due to geopolitics. And so that's what that whole... Lalibela enterprise of the series. The main church is Georgis or George and uh, St. George. And then there are several other churches around it built out of that, that monolithic structure. And so, yeah. So the idea would be that it's like, it's, is it, but does it map onto Jerusalem? Like, is, is there, some, are some people tried to kind of find analogies between the actual city of Jerusalem and, and Lalibela or? You'll find like engravings of the star of David. And uh, for, for that matter, uh, uh, imagery that later gets associated with a particular German regime, but that also yeah. is a much more ancient symbol. Uh, we won't get the. the yeah. Video when Lali Bella, I saw the craziest things I've ever seen, which is, crusader crosses and like you said you see stars of david with crosses in them and and like and, and so that's i mean it's you feel like you're looking at this puzzle that you can't completely understand because you know some of those crosses definitely look like hospital hospitaller hospital hospitaller crosses and so i was like man there were people crossed a lot of people came through here and the you know the the crossing of influences and the the discussions must have been pretty pretty vivid yeah, it's a, it's a, what people don't understand about the empire is the way in which it was extremely exclusive, but also inclusive. And you and Richard talked about the biblical canon and how open it is. And pe- mm. people got to know, you know, it's, it's the West that has a closed canon. The Greek <laughs> communion and our communion, the Afroasiatic communion, have technically open canons. So at any moment, the Holy Synods could decide to add books to the Bible. And, you know, that's, that's their right. You know, that's their apostolic right. Uh, but in any event, you know, we just got books and writings from everywhere. One of the things from our monastic tradition, which I always point out to people, is that we have um, uh, Aragawi Manfasawi, who's a different Aragawi, the spiritual elder, who I think his name is John Saba. 
And then we also have Marisak, who's Isaac the Syrian. Yeah. And these are two of the three. This is two thirds of what we call the book of monks that every monk is supposed to read in our tradition. Mm. And they're post Chalcedonian members of the church of the East, which only affirms the first two councils. And I know Isaac the Syrian is venerated in your tradition as well. Yeah. And I, I often point to that as like, it's not even like one book. It's, 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 it's the majority of the monastic tradition. The texts they have to read are from the church of the East. Yeah. And you also talked about, um, this liturgical rite that includes on Good Friday, the thief on the right. Well, we have that as well. And we actually have the expanded version. There's a whole play I've seen on YouTube of the Syriac version, which is like 15 minutes. Our version is like an hour. And it's, it's really h- hilarious. You know, the cherub berates the thief is like, you're unworthy, you're wicked, you know, you're ugly, you know, you, well, who are you to come here before that? And all the, but eventually, you know, he, he, he gets lets in. It, he yeah. gets in. Yeah. Wait, so these are like, these are what, like kind of liturgical plays or kind of? Or- yes, it's a liturgical. So that one, the thief or the outlaw on the right, that's performed by the clergy on Good Friday. Um, but the the monastic books are just sort of writings that are supposed to be studied by all monks. And mm. so we have John Saba, the spiritual elder, and we also have Isaac the Syrian. Yeah, and, because and Isaac the, the Syrian, how can anybody deny it? Like, he, he's so amazing. Like, it, what he says is such pure gold that I, that's why I feel like even if even if even if for us, like in maybe in practice, he was supposedly a heretic. Like, he says nothing heretical that and and. He's so inspired that I, I think it, it just kind of, uh, how can I say this? It soothes over whatever, whatever uh, distinctions existed, you know. Absolutely. And I'll point, if you, there are people, you know, who are in your audience, in your tradition, I'll point you to the book on Isaac the Syrian by Metropolitan Hilarion, which is a fantastic book. And it, 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 it talks about how him, uh, along with one of the Gregories, I, I always get them confused, you know, they get into this, you know, that all should be saved that, yeah. and that is considered officially in the Orthodox church, a heresy. And, and, and he, but he explains why he's thinking in that way. And that minor thing doesn't take away all of the great spiritual advice on silence, on how to read the Psalms. One of the pieces of advice he gives is that the way you should pray is you begin by reading the Psalms and you don't say, oh, I'm going to do a chapter a day or a million uh, chapters a day. You just begin reading. And then when your body collapses, that's when you stop, you know? And that's what he says. And if that's, if for you, if that's a sentence, good, that's, that's your, to your spiritual benefit. But if it's three chapters for you, then so be it. Mm. And if you do the Psalter all night, also, so be it. That's amazing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Some amazing things. So people, so do people still see La Libella as a kind of pilgrimage place? Absolutely. They, okay. Absolutely. As I said earlier, Christmas is the largest one celebrated there, but Pascha is also big in La Libella. Mm, interesting. So but one you of go the there for any holiday. I mean, yeah, exactly. The, the amount of learned people in that area is ridiculous. Like the ratio of learned scholars. Mm. I mean, in the diaspora, we we have to beg for you know one or two learned scholars per church. But there, you know, you see like hundreds of clergy. You know, people. What people don't understand is the large churches. I said there were small, medium, and large churches in Ethiopia, especially in the capital city, because that's where you can make some money. On a more cynical note, but the large churches in Ethiopia would have 300 clergy trained. I, I mean, it, think about what a service is like when there are 300, you know, and sometimes they have shifts. So they're working at, at different times. The administrator, the hierarch monk at my church, he always tells me funny stories. And he told me there's a, a, a tradition of St. Jared or St. Yarit. Uh, and it's a book called, uh, a part of the prayer of his books called Zainagis, which means uh, God's reign or God is king. And so when your parish gets big enough, you can hire a Zainagis chanter. So the job of this Zainagis chanter is between the hours of 3 a.m. and maybe 4.30 a.m. every day, whether there are a thousand parishioners or whether no parishioners arrive, is to pray and chant this prayer. And so all the large churches have this guy where you can go any day of the week. The church is always open and you go in at 3 a.m. And there's somebody there. Chanting this prayer. 
Exactly. And the idea is to, you know, um, Ethiopia, unlike other members of our communion, was never fully conquered. You know, we could say we conquered ourselves internally, but we were never fully conquered by another outside force. Yeah. So our Christianity was not a Christianity in hiding. It was a Christianity, if, if anything, with too much prosperous ease, mm. which gave us time to really develop these traditions. And so these large parishes try to resemble the angels and to try to keep the watch so that at every hour of the day, there is some sort of prayer going on. And with a few meal breaks, that, that's very true, especially well, if you go to the monasteries. I imagine if, if, if they're doing that 3 a.m. prayer in just like a regular town church, I mean, the monasteries must be completely insane. One of the things that really distinguishes also Ethiopian Christianity from, uh, from let's say, the Greek-Russian uh, communion is the drums and the rhythm. Um, and so I'm curious to know how, like, at least what are the traditions about that? Because, I mean, do, do people see it as coming from all the way from Solomon or is there, are there other traditions about the use of the drums and the, the rhythmic instruments? It's a very great question. And this goes to the African side of our hybridity. We are, uh, I mean, the cops can argue a little bit, but nobody can argue like us that we are the, the African Orthodox church. And so mm. you better know we're going to have some drums, but yes, they have an asterisk next to it. And the asterisk is that uh, they certainly seem very ancient and again, it depends if you want to go with the mainline narrative of the church or go to what the historical evidence says. The mainline of the church, yeah, we'll tie it back all the way to the time of Judaism. The, the people searching for more and more evidence don't really see evidence of the drums before medieval times. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that they weren't there, but it, it does mean that the tradition was less elaborate before there and we're still searching for evidence. So... There is, um, I believe it was uh, Father Mandorf um, was a professor of, of a friend of mine at, who went to St. Vlad's. And he told this story, which I will tell again, that, you know, in your communion, the liturgy has this balance between Byzantium rite and the Palestinian rite. And the Byzantian rite kind of baptized or Christianized what was the pagan theater before. And so the elaborate elements come from that. Whereas the more monastic tradition of Palestine was more interested in kind of a simple Psalter and, and maybe a psalmody plus that, mm. but not much more. And we see the same thing within Ethiopia. So one of the extra liturgical or non-Eucharistic liturgical schools is called Akwakwam. And the Akwakwam tradition is where the drum is beat. That's where all the drum beating comes from uh, historically in Ethiopia that has centuries of, of evidence. And then you have a, a more minor modern Amharic tradition, which is established from about the 70s till now. Which okay. Is, uh, it, it, we, and we could talk about that, but there's this whole- So you're saying it era. developed in a particular place within Ethiopia. Like it wasn't something that was universal before. It, it, just kind of it was not. I'll tell you- my grandfather and a lot of his ancestors are buried at a monastery called Waldeba, which is in the middle of the land of which the civil war is going on right now. And Waldeba is southwest of Aksum, but northwest of Gondar. So it's kind of the halfway point between the city of Gondar and the city of Aksum, which were two major cities yeah. for a long time and two former capitals of the empire. So Waldeba is square in the middle of that. It's a fifth century monastery. And they view the drum as worldly. Oh, there. right. Okay. So the drum is forbidden at that monastery. And that monastery doesn't even acknowledge that whole Aquaquam tradition, which is this drum beating and elaborate uh, swinging of the staff as well. Yeah, the, the staff, yeah. They don't acknowledge, they use the staff just to hold themselves up and they only believe in a cappella worship similar to the rest of the orthodox church mm. and they do the main eucharistic liturgy and they do the liturgy of the hours so what mind boggles many ethiopian christians which many even i would say ethiopian deacons don't know if they don't know the tradition writ large is that if you go on pascha the feast of feasts expecting like the craziest drums if you go to that monastery, you're not going to get that. You're gonna what get you're going to get is the liturgy of the hours followed by the Eucharistic liturgy. And that's the same thing that they do every day of the year. Oh, okay. So, so they don't, different. they don't even have kind of festal liturgies and they, they yeah. Interesting. Readings, well, I mean, uh, that could be like the monastic, like just, 
Like all these monks, they're even in in the, in the our tradition, there are these stories of these monks that wouldn't chant melodies. Like they thought melodies were worldly, so they would just basically do it monotone, just so there wouldn't be any variation in their in their chanting. You know? No, the, the, well, these ones will definitely not be monotone. They'll sing, but they only will sing the a cappella things. Right. Yeah. Uh, they have this view. Uh, for example, my bishop, who I mentioned earlier, he used to love hitting the drum when he was a monk, and that's rare for monks. Mm bishops are forbidden from hitting really? it standing up they oh. can sit down and they could hit it during the slow part but any sort of fast melody while they're standing the bishops are forbidden and he's antsy because <laughs> if it were just up to him he would, he would love, love to still hit it but it would scandalize the entire church for him that's, to hit the drum that's amazing you know, which is itself a holy instrument used to praise god but it's yeah. just it's seen as kind of beneath the position of of a bishop and it's rare among monks it's usually a married priest or deacons or now also choir members who, who could be men or women who would hit the drum well when i was in axum i i had a very strange meeting where i met three scholars from tel aviv three jewish scholars from tel aviv um and all three of them were kind of experts on ethiopia especially Experts on Ethiopia trying to find the Jewish connection, like trying to see, you know, how how close the Jewish connection is. And one of these scholars told me that in Ethiopia, they use what's called a sistrum, yes. right, which is a, a staff. And and it has like a it's hard to explain. It has I mean, I'll, I'll post a picture of it. It has these little metal uh, parts inside that move. And so you shake it and it chinks. Right. It chinks mm -hmm. like. A, and he said that sistrums were common in ancient worship. They even yes. they exist in Egypt. They exist in all these ancient cultures. In the Minoan civilization as well. In, oh, okay. So but they're described in scripture, in the Bible. It, it talks about systems in the Psalms, like mm -hmm. part of the instruments that were used. And he yes. said, right now, he said, in Ethiopia is the only place in the entire world where they still use this instrument. That's and for him, true. it was like a connection. For him, it was like a, a way to connect Ethiopia to kind of ancient Hebrew worship because he said it's, it's the they still have this tradition from like thousands of years ago and and they need to, it needs to be almost like a continuous tradition because you if you just saw it just named in the scripture you wouldn't know what it was unless you had actually had one in your hand and seen what it yeah. looks like and used it so there has to be this kind of continual uh physical transmission of the instrument for you to get to now and still go to church and see people chinking this instrument i'll tell you a funny story i have a lot of secular family and we were at a secular Christmas celebration, which is funny enough. And they had a sistrum in their house and we we're playing charades. And so my family members, you know, my parents age and they know what it is, but their child has no idea <laughs> what it is. So I wrote it in Amharic, which is Sanasal and Giz, it's called Sanasal or in English, the sistrum and plural yeah. sistra, like any sort of Latin plural. And I wrote it in English and Amharic. And that poor boy, my little cousin, worked his best to try to charade what it was. He had no idea what it was. And when they saw what I wrote, they said, how mean and unfair are you? And I said, look, you have this object in your house. You're venerating it by, by having it there as a cultural prop. So we're going we're gonna to use it. But yeah, it's a general Eastern Mediterranean thing. So it includes the Jewish culture, like you said, Pharaonic Egypt and the Minoan civilization, if you look at the, the remains of their, their artwork, which is uh, from the island of Crete the, the, uh, the, that was there before, you know, it was uh, the, during the Bronze Age, before yeah. the Bronze Age collapse. So um, all of those civilizations had this very ancient instrument. Yeah, and that is part of the, the Aguaquam school, which is, it accompanies the drum. It, it's never by itself. It's always accompanying the drum and it also is related that tradition has blended in with the poetry tradition so it's used with the poetry as well what the drum and the sistrum are never used for and i always have to make this explicit and this is every ethiopian church is that the eucharistic liturgy is totally a cappella. Okay. this is for post liturgical celebrations like hymns that are done mm. or pre-eucharistic liturgical hymns interesting it's clear uh use the word kidan when you're talking about the hagiographies the full term is al kidan which means promise or covenant so there's the salota kidan which is the prayer of the covenant which begins the eucharistic liturgy mm -hmm. and in the eucharistic liturgy there are i think three to four i think four places where a bell is rung 
to signify different things. When hallelujah or hallelujah is said to begin the liturgy, a bell is rung. When uh, the Lord have mercies are said, a bell is rung. When the communion uh, descends, uh, a bell is rung. Mm -hmm. And when the catechumens are told to depart, that's not in order, I, I'm saying it off memory, but at those four points, catechumen, uh, beginning of the liturgy, uh, catechumen departure, which is the halfway point when the, after the gospel is read, the uh, sayings of the Lord have mercy and the descent of the communion. At those four points, a bell is rung. Everything else in the Eucharistic liturgy is purely a cappella. Mm. The mouth alone is the instrument. But before that period in a, in a certain specific time and after that period, you're allowed to bring out the sistrum and you're allowed to bring out the cabaro or the drum. And you're allowed to use that to make music. But again, it's not compulsory. <laughs> and some of the monastics don't like doing that. Yeah, yeah. So we've been talking for a while. So I have one last big question for you, I guess. And then, and then we'll, we'll call it, we'll call it good. Although I, I could talk about this forever. Like I could just keep going. I know, but I don't want to, I don't want to abuse people's like attention as well. Um, so in, in the, in our podcast, one of the things we presented was this, this uh, Byzantine tradition, or actually Syrian tradition, but, but accepted by the Byzantines of the, the apocalypse of Pseudomethodius, right? And so, and in this tradition, you have this idea uh, and it's present in other Byzantine traditions as well, the meeting of Alexander and Ethiopia, right? The, the, the idea even that, Eth that Alexander's mother uh, was Ethiopian. And then the idea that the Roman emperor will hide in, the, in Ethiopia, right? I don't know if you follow that story. So the idea that, I did. that the last Roman emperor will hide in Ethiopia, whatever that means, and that at the end of times, will kind of rise out of Ethiopia. And that will be like Ethiopia stretching her hands out unto the Lord. And that will kind of signify the, basically the end of the world is what, what it seems to be. And so I don't know if there is something, like I don't know if there is are some traditions which are akin to that in Ethiopia or, or at least like what you thought when you, when you heard that, that, that description. I had never heard a tradition like that in Ethiopia. That doesn't mean it, exi it doesn't exist. I just haven't heard that. I think it's in um, Matthew 12, right? That the queen of the South will rise in, in condemnation of this generation. That That's prophetic language from the Bible as well. Yeah. Um, I have always heard this in politics, who is the successor of Rome? Because I'm interested in, in the study of empire. And you see, you know, nobody in Byzantium called it Byzantium. They yeah. thought of themselves as Rome, even though they were conquered by Rome and became Romans. They were the Eastern part of the Roman Empire. So you see the geographic Rome shifts from Rome itself to Byzantium, which thought of itself as Rome. Yeah. And a lot of people nowadays ask, like, who's the successor? And there are some people who look at the current modern Russian state that has exited communism and is got some sort of amalgamation of, of different ideas of when to intervene, when to not. And, you know, that, that military cathedral that they built has this archaeo futuristic vibe to it, where it's like super, you know, powerful representation of the state, but also of the Orthodox church. Yeah. A patriarch Kirill has also commented a lot on Ethiopian situations. And, oh, really? And, yeah. Oh yeah. He's supporting the current Ethiopian regime which ousted during the, the reign of Donald Trump, it ousted this regime that was backed by the US for a long time. And Donald Trump, you know, love him or hate him, his nonchalance towards Ethiopia allowed Ethiopia to kind of rule itself instead of being guided by the, the global American mm -hmm. empire. And, and so a lot of people think that Russia will be this prophetic, you know, Russia is the successor state to Rome for many reasons, because mm. of the connections with Byzantium, which connected to the original Rome. But as you said, it may be that from the extremities of the world, from the ends of the world, the queen of the South may rise again. And there are many people, I am myself an Ethiopian restorationist, and there are many others who are uh, elite in the diaspora. I always noticed a lot of the people involved with the beginnings of St. Vladimir's were some of the people tied to the Russian elites who were expelled out of the country. Yeah. And I think not enough people realize that. And the same thing has happened with the Ethiopian 
situation. And I, I'm hopeful something like that for happen. I don't know if that's going to bring about judgment day. Only the Lord knows when that time will be. But uh, I do like you and like Richard uh, would say that perhaps Ethiopia, I'll say it that way, perhaps Ethiopia has a role to play. Yeah, that's for sure. I'm, I'm sure that Ethiopia has the role to play. But I, I, I think that we're all kind of fascinated to see what, what, what that is and kind of, I mean, I think that's been a fascination for mine forever. And, you know, my intuition, which I now see is just not an intuition at all. You know, I've, since we did the podcast, I've had several people write me because I said things like Ethiopia doesn't just have the ark. Ethiopia is the ark. And I've had Ethiopia, now I've had Ethiopians write me and say, yeah, that's what everybody thinks. Like you're not coming into some great insight. Oh, they didn't say it that way, but they're basically saying uh, all Ethiopians think that Ethiopia is the ark. And I'm like, okay, yeah. Well, well, yeah, you, you have to, you have to be careful. We, we Ethiopians can vie. Uh, I don't know how the Greeks and the Armenians are. Maybe us three can compete to who has the most hubris and love uh, <laughs> of whole country and patriotism, but oh, yeah, they're pretty up there. If you say nice things about Ethiopia, we love you. <laughs> There you go. Well, I'm happy to know that I'm loved by some Ethiopians. I'm sure that'll be that'll be something that will that will be very useful to me one day. I'm pretty sure. And so this has been really wonderful. I really enjoyed it, and I feel like it could go on forever. So what I'm going to do is we're going to put this out, and we're going to see the comments. We're going to see what people say, see what people ask. And if you have questions, if you have things, because there are so many roads we could have gone. Uh, write it down in the comments, and uh, and uh, who knows? Well, maybe we'll just do a second part and go into what people want to hear about. So thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.